In this session of our webinar series, we are trying to take a look at how Bhagavad Gita has some guidance to offer in the matter of handling anxiety, insecurity, uncertainty, and so on. Speaking today on this April 6, 2020, this is the time when all of us are indeed very concerned with the disease that is spreading across the globe called Corona virus disease, COVID-19. And I believe as I am speaking, more than 64,000 thousand people have died around the world and some 12 lakhs or so of people are infected with this corona virus so never seen before scenario has emerged therefore all the more reason for us to take a look at how our scriptures have some guidance to offer whether it is this unprecedented unique scenario or various other forms of calamities and adversities, the Bhagavad Gita asks us to shed or to let go of fear. Gita, as we know well, is a restatement of Upanishadic wisdom. Swami Vivekananda, in one of his speeches, says the word abhihi, bhihi means fear, abhihi is fearless. The word abhihi appears in the Upanishads at a number of places. And no doubt, the ending of fear is talked of in many Upanishads using different words. Upanishads, of course, go to a great height where it is said, where there is duality, there will be fear. The other and us, that duality. Or within us, there can be a duality of how I am and what I want to be and all this which is all a play of the mind. But without going to those heights of rising above all sense of duality and seeing and following that seeing, experiencing the non-dual Advaita truth that I am indestructible, I alone am, and everything else comes and goes, I as Satchit remain unaffected, as invincible, as immortal, and so on, that realization is a far cry for all of us. On a second notch, we have various tips on how we may gather energy. As I describe certain pieces, from Bhagavad Gita, definitely some of you will have a question. All the description is very good. The Sthita Prajna is fearless. Gunatita has no botheration. And the ideal Bhakta, the great Jnani or a great Yogi is free from anxiety. Namaste to all of them. But how do we arrive at such a state? How do we become a sthita prajna would be a natural question. I would like to quickly say that the Bhagavad Gita addresses that issue all through the whole text. The practice of karma yoga. Don't focus on what you get. Emphasize on what you may give. It's an attitudinal change. 
or at another place can you change your outlook in life to not continuing with personal ambition but aspiring to do something for god mat karma krit mat paramaha and so on or at many places shri krishna has given beautiful pointers to the indestructible soul the pure self within us we may contemplate we are not to read a shloka na jayate mriyate va vipaschit or some such shloka and say oh yeah i know this and then close it and go for some other you know engagement of thinking a friend of mine would uh, read a little gita and say wow 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 how nicely it is said and then change over to some kind of entertainment he would even then watch two hours of some movie hollywood or bollywood or anything then what is he doing he has done a short work of gita and he is ready to spare hours and hours for matters of the world no do your duty gita doesn't say run away from your duty to look after your family to discharge your responsibilities you need to earn money you need to keep relationships in the society you need to take care of your family members towards all that you do what you regard as your duty bhagavad gita is never tired of saying stay with duty but with regard to a hundred other things that you do where your energy gets dissipated be more aware be more alert so a study of gita not just as information over there but to inform our buddhi our intellect i use the word inform meaning to awaken the buddhi to see various scenarios from a different angle of view to give one one more example how we may arrive at that kind of state of mind is where gita at number of places says give up your raga and dvesha give up your vaira and sanga nirvairaha nissangaha araga dvesha takritam or icha dvesha have to be given up so at several places in several uh, pairs of words shri krishna is asking us to develop objectivity you and i suffer because we take everything to heart somebody doesn't pay attention we say see she did not even smile at me he did not even say good evening to me and so on we take it to heart rather than standing apart and looking at number one how so and so behaved and equally number two how my mind is reacting by old habits without reaction can we act as pujya swami chinmayananji used to say act do not react all right in the gita we have for example chapter 6 which asks us to train our mind and apply our mind to the pure self atma sanstam manakrutva na kinchid api chintayet anchor your mind in the pure atma but as a way to prepare for that as the road map that would uh, apply to this scene shri krishna says practice this yoga there's a beautiful expression in the 23rd verse anirvinna chetasa tam vidya dukkha sanyoga viyogam yoga sannitam sa nischayena yoktavya yogo anirvinna chetasa nirvinna means getting depressed dejected oh ho what will happen now i have lost all this and looks like i am going to lose more tomorrow this kind of despondency 
dejection, depression is nirveda. Adjective here is nirvinna. Anirvinna chetasa. Yoga ha, yoktavya ha, Sri Krishna says. For that matter, even before his formal instructions begin in the 11th verse of chapter 2, before even that, Sri Krishna says in the very second shloka of the second chapter, Shudram Hradaya Daurbalyam Yaktva Uttishta Bharata. Oh Arjuna, oh descendant of Bharata's dynasty, Uttishta, arise. Giving up or letting go of this petty weaknesses of your heart. In varieties of ways, all through the Gita, Lord Krishna talks about certain qualities that we may develop. You want to call it developing or you want to use another language? Discovering. When you live alertly, your own pettiness, your own lower values get exposed so much that you will have no other way than to leave them. When you find yourself not able to get up in the morning, if there is an insight, hey, what am I doing? I have had enough rest. What is this? lying on the bed for some more time. This is nonsense. Suppose that kind of insight arises in you, you will jump out of the bed. So, agreed. Ultimately, there is nothing like cultivation or development or some kind of process. Though, from a third party point of view, it is a process. In you, it is all awareness. Sensitivity being you know, watchful. Suppose you are harsh towards people. Now, if you are watchful, if you are attentive, you realize, hey, I'm, I'm treating this man without due respect. Who am I to order him about? In this way, suppose you become aware, then you are told, the way you treat that person will change. So, miserliness or harshness or self-centeredness. Once I was going in a car and there were three men in the car. And the one sitting um, next to me driving the car and two men, all three of them were older to me. They were over there. And one of them in the back seat was continuously asking me something or the other, telling me something or the other. It was about 45 minutes to drive. Towards the end of it, I just said, you know, whatever his name is, oh, you know, uh, you have been talking continuously, asking me things, telling me things. Uh, wonderful, I appreciate your interest in the Vedanta. But now, the remaining five minutes, can you give a chance to these other two people? They may perhaps have something to say. They may perhaps have something to ask me. And so on. So that person was not aware at all. I don't know why he spoke and spoke and he spoke. Maybe he was thinking that by asking all those Vedanta questions, he was impressing me. There was no need to impress me. He had to be sensitive. There are two other members of the same satsang group who may want to say something. So I agreed. Ultimately, awareness in the beginning, awareness in the middle, and awareness at the end is the great medicine for letting go of numerous negativities, including fear, anxiety. All these are not rooted in truth. All these are rooted in the false ego, the false separate self. Lord Krishna at some place talks of Brahmana Dharma and he uses the word while giving nine qualities. One of them is Kshanti. 
come what may, the Brahmana bears with them. The Brahmana, a sattvic person, may not have the valor, the heroic qualities of fighting a battle and so on. Uh, he may be more devoted to studies and contemplation, teaching and so on. But doesn't matter when hard times come face to face or he comes face to face with adversity, he bears with numerous ups and downs, losses, even the loss of near and dear ones. A death takes place around him. Shamo damak, chanti arjavam, these qualities. Kshanti there means putting up with hard times and maintaining inner balance. Very next verse, 43rd in the chapter 18 of Gita, Sri Krishna gives the qualities of Kshatriya Dharma. And from nine qualities that he gives with regard to Brahmana, he gives six with regard to Kshatriya. And one of them, in fact, the last one is last but not the least, is Yudhecha Apalayanam. A Kshatriya on the battlefield does not run away, does not flee, does not take to his heels because of a situation becoming dangerous. He is courageous. So in countless ways, we are asked to stay firm. Now comes, what are the spiritual practices? Now in the light of this COVID-19, or novel COVID-19, that I suppose is the full name of it, we are told in our you know, WhatsApp groups and so on, recite this, listen to this sukta, listen to that mantra, chant this. One of them is Vishnu Sahasranama. This is a matter of faith. Those who don't have faith may mock at it. God bless them. But many of them have faith in our rishis. We regard the rishis as some mystics. They were great mystics. They saw beyond what people ordinarily could see. Therefore, without being too mechanical, rather without being mechanical at all, reciting Vishnu Sahasranama is said to give us both Drishta and Adrishta Phala. Drishta means what is uh, uh, obvious. Drishta is what can be seen. Drishta is, you know, if you sit down and putting your heart into the practice, recite Vishnu Sahasranama, right away at the end of 20 minutes, you will find the mind becoming calmer. Those names and those lokas, that whole composition has certainly a certain charm about it. And if you have studied the meanings of those names, many of those names have such wonderful meanings as though they are addressing the present situation. That is drishta, that you know. Then there is adrishta phala. This is where the mystics come into play. The mystics guide their students and they say, do this, recite this, and listen to this sound, and so on. And not all sounds are the same. Certain sounds have their own special power. Of course, once more, this is a matter of faith. Lord Vishnu is the protector. Srishti, Stiti and Samhara, all are under him in a sense, but especially Stiti, to protect, to preserve, is his specialization. And therefore, Worshipping, adoring, and connecting our mind to Mahavishnu is the way to get protected. Shiva Bhaktas would chant Mrathyunjaya Mantra, Trambakam Yajamahe, Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam, Purvarukamiva Bandhanath, Mrityor Mukshiya Amritat. 
The word bandhana there means the stalk of the cucumber. Because the stalk connects and binds the cucumber, the fruit, to the creeper. From the stalk, when the cucumber is ripe, it just falls easily. Likewise, help me slip off from death, from bondage, from suffering, from a whole lot of negativity. The cucumber separates itself from the creeper. You and I wish to be separated from the sphere of limitations, the domain of suffering. We want to assert our divine nature. Thus, Mukshiya, may we be liberated. A father in Bangalore said to his son, Please recite Mratyunjaya Mantra, Chambakam Vyajabhe, every day. You know, older generation had more faith and they did not worry much about meaning. The younger generation wants the meaning of everything. The son said, Appa, I will do it, but give me a proper meaning of this mantra. And just today, I, in fact, I for that father and son pair, I prepared word by word meanings and sent them. Meanings I sent them. And uh, that became an opportunity for me to again revisit that mantra and see what is the hidden meaning of Pushti Vardhana or Sugandhi and so on. It is from the Vedas. It's very ancient. So we need to see what the words mean going by those good old times. There are great commentaries on those Vedic portions. Sayana, Mahidhara and others have commented on those Veda mantras. So, recite Trambakam Yajamahe. Recite Vishnu Sahasranama. And through all this, you and I can gather our energy. The process of moving from weakness to strength is indeed a very challenging affair. No one can claim that this is the way. But there are many ways at the same time. But which way will work for which person is the big question. But then, are we putting in our two cents? Have we tried out this or that path? This or that exercise? This or that way of sadhana? Have we tried? There used to be a joke. Somebody, I believe, complained to God. Lord, not even once you blessed me to get lottery price. You know, lottery tickets and so on. Every day he complained to God, you are not showering your grace on me. I haven't won lottery even once. Then God got so tired or angry with this fellow, irritated, irritated. And one day God spoke to him. First you buy the lottery ticket. Then let us see whether you can win the prize. Look at this chap. He hadn't even bought the lottery ticket at all. So that of course is an extreme scenario. But many a time when you and I introspect, we find that we haven't done our two cents. To use the expression of Sri Ramakrishna, we haven't taken that one step which is our job to take. It is said we take one step towards God, God will come ten steps towards us. So we must do our part. So as we look at varieties of teachings of the spiritual science, certain basic principles hold good across all the you know, different topics, subjects. And one of them, one of those basic principles is be true to yourself. Somebody, in fact, once admitted a spiritual teacher somewhere. He said in a private small circle, 
all i realize that if i practice 5% of what i advise everybody in the town i will be 500 times better than what i am now so apparently this guy had right very good knowledge of the bible or the gita of dhammapada or granth sahib whichever he had vast knowledge when anybody would ask him for advice he would come out with excellent pieces of advice but his own life probably especially his personal life down the platform in his privacy perhaps he would compromise so you and i need to introspect and not to blame ourselves or condemn ourselves or to say oh i am not doing sadhana and adding further to our misery but having a dispassionate look at how we have been living we must work on ourselves bhagavad gita addresses this issue reassuring us time and again that we have the capacity human life in fact is truly fulfilled by tapping the potential that we have with us within us tap the potential you don't have to go somewhere far away the treasure is inside you i guess jesus christ put it in the statement the kingdom of heaven is within you so different mystics different prophets different messiahs and different spiritual teachers express this truth in different ways coming to gita may i say in three places if not more lord krishna says i reside in your own heart then why have anxiety ishvara sarva bhutanam hridesha arjuna tishtati sarvasya chaham hridi sannivishta hridi sarveshu vishtitah visheshena sthitah i am present in the bosom it is i who make the mind work mattah smritihi nanam apohanancha even a 10 minutes study of the original gita shlokas and looking at them reflecting on them not for some other use but for a personal connection what this means to me what this means to the way i should live my life from that angle of view not saying oh this shloka is wonderful i'm going to write an article and i'll quote this i'm going to give a talk at such a such place i will use this shloka or you know a husband looking at a shloka this is exactly what my wife needs or the wife looking at another shlokas meanwhile maybe just next to him saying oh this teaching of gita is exactly what my husband needs or both of them thinking this is what our children need these days this younger generation don't understand these are the things they need what about you what about you yourself oh yeah yeah we too need but you know you have some occasions sometimes couple of places when i went to some home both the father and mother were continuously telling me tommy ji tell this son of ours tell this daughter of ours tell tell them as though these people are perfect <laughs> so that is a weakness with all of us so coming back bhagavad gita's guidance to face anxiety to face adversity to face scenarios where there is uncertainty or insecurity agreed the scenarios are really really frightening in spite of them gita says uttishta bharata tasmad yogi bhava arjuna yogi bhava and towards the end in the 18th chapter 
if we have missed out all other teachings, Lord Krishna again says, Sarva Dharma an Parityajya Mamekam Sharanam Braja. Surrender to me, giving up so many other ideas, other notions. I'm especially fond of the meaning Dharma, for Sarva Dharma, uh, from a Vedanta perspective the identity, the role. I am a father. What is my Pitra Dharma? I am a Kshatriya. What is my Kshatriya Dharma? I am a teacher. What is my Shikshaka Dharma? I am a son. What is my Putra Dharma? These are all Dharmas. Right? So, you and I, like Mah Maharshi Ramana would say, ask yourself, who, who am I? The answer comes, I am this, I am that. So various ideas of who we are. Lord Krishna says, give up to your ideas of I am boss, I am servant, I am old, I am young. These are all dharmas. Sarva dharma and parityajya. Swami Chinmayananji of course says, the dharma of BMI, body, mind and intellect. After all, it is through this body, mind and intellect that we look at ourselves as mother or father, sister or brother, as a head of department or as a young student, freshman, sophomore, whatever. Right? It is through BMI, body, mind and intellect. And putting them to the back seat for a moment, can you think of yourself as belonging to God? Can you think of your life as being driven by God? Not to misuse it saying, oh, God is running my life, therefore I can do anything I want. Use common sense. Spirituality is never opposed to common sense. Within the frame, frame of common sense, you have options. So if you go for that, that sweet contemplation, I belong to God. God is giving me guidance. Without violating common sense, you, you, therefore you can then follow what science tells you, what law of the land tells you. So you follow the rules, follow the guidance that comes to you from everywhere in the pre present context of battling this coronavirus. Saying God is with me, you don't neglect hygiene. If the guidance says wash your hands with soap every now and then, and when you wash, wash for 20 seconds, don't make it a quick affair of five, five seconds, then the virus, if God forbid, you know, if the virus is sitting on your hand, it won't go if you hurriedly do it. Therefore, what I mean by common sense is follow all these tips, follow that guidance, and on, on the other hand, you carry a sense of how you belong to the whole. The whole is the higher truth. You and I are the part, part and the whole. God is the whole and we are a part. In this way, we must exercise our mind going by the guidance of Bhagavad Gita. We must exercise our mind in those teachings of selfless service, karma yoga, devotion to God, bhakti yoga, and contemplation on the inner truth of our being, nana yoga, and of course, practices of Raja Yoga. So, when we contemplate, get more and more clear and use those guidance or forms of guidance for our own mid course correction. We live every day better than how we did on the previous day. Then, from our within, definitely a new dimension gets uncovered. That is what Kena Upanishad says, Atmana Vindate Viryam. 
all strength comes to us from within us atmana vindate viryam vidyaya vindate amrutam is the powerful statement of the samavediya kenopanishad let me pause here and as always welcome some questions or comments on this outlook based on bhagavad gita on handling anxiety insecurity uncertainty and so on om namo bhagavate vasudevaya okay so we have uh, shiv shankar uh, rada shiv shiv yadalam let me enable his microphone self muted it says uh, Why is the microphone not turning on? Ah oh, no, uh, uh, I think. Ah oh, no, it's on. Yes, uh, how are you? Please ask your question. It was wonderful listening to you. I just wanted to say I was very happy with the message that you gave you. and also watching you. Uh, if not directly connected to what you mentioned, can I ask a question? um normally uh, we have our own traditions uh religion etc as a, a history does that yeah. make sense or is it wrong to have history and culture which gives us the way our uh, past was based on which yeah. we believe wrong yeah is it correct so we definitely have to draw from our past uh, however the past is you know so vast and as you know the history has been narrated by different people in different ways it's an ocean uh, so if i understood your question rightly you are perhaps asking whether we should uh, guide our own life with inputs from the past inputs from our heritage uh, i i guess uh, definitely because uh, uh, every human being seeks to have a sense of identity in this uh, journey of life so it always helps us to know that uh, among our ancestors uh, family wise or even as a community or as a country there were such and such people who were uh, you know who were very good in certain things they left behind some healthy practices and so on so to learn from the past is indeed uh, most helpful is it uh, what you meant um you answered my question the reason Party. i asked is reading about from one other great guru he said yeah. indians live in the past ah. the future i oh, okay <laughs> i am confused with that statement so i was trying to seek an answer thank yeah, you yeah i think uh, rest is good you clarified now uh, i have also heard that comment and that comment uh, is partly true and that comment is targeted against those of us the indians who do a you know a, 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 a not a full job but a partial job we just say ah oh, our ancestors knew it all and uh, our ancestors were great and so on and um, we don't sometimes take full responsibility uh, in our present life how we may be like them so uh, when uh, something is discovered for example in the west 
and some Indian says, this was said in the Mahabharata and so on. So the not only Westerners, but many Indians also feel, look at this chap. He just wants to take some credit. And uh, 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 how are they? How are the Indians living now? And so on. Therefore, that person's criticism is in a way sensible, but uh, it's not fully true. And if if he if what I mean is if he means that uh, we must just forget the past, that would be a blunder. No one can forget the past. No one can uh, try to do that. That would be uh, losing our identity, and in no time, some other culture or some other you know civilization would uh, hijack us, and uh, that can lead to a lot of conflict. We have our own. Something inside us. To complete my answer, someone like Gandhi, he went to South Africa. I think some 20 years, 23 years he lived there. Then uh, he was in England too. So uh, whichever was first and whichever was later. So he did, did study varieties of things, a lot of Western things, Western religions as well as Western culture. And uh, then he studied the Gita. Certainly, in his case, what his own ancestors, that is, the givers of Gita and Upanishads, had conveyed, went so deep into his heart. So, with due respect to other religions, did he not later hold on to Gita, whom he called his mother? So, there are so many cases where you and I draw strength. And uh, that critic is right if we do a you know, convenient cover up and uh, sometimes to pass the buck and so on, uh, that, that would be sad. Uh, and the West also, uh, the West, I think some country like America, many times they don't have much of a history, it's just a 400 year old country. And therefore, uh, they have no other option than to look at the future and they pay a heavy price out of their lack of identity they have an identity crisis so it's not that they are they are having a wonderful hassle free life and we have always depressing moments it's not so even today the good news i must share is even today in these troubled times there are a number of eminent indians you know, all kinds of professions and communities and so on, who are living a very balanced life. You, you and I meet such people when we travel or in our own towns, and we are very impressed. Wow, this person has guts. This person has certain inner stability. So uh, those statements have to be taken with a grain of salt. There may be a little truth in it, but it's, it's not true in a sweeping sense. Thank you. It was a wonderful, practical question. Thank you so much. Hario. Hario. So we go to <clears throat> Sheshadri. Uh, let me turn his mic. Yes, your mic. Hario Swamiji. Uh, Hari. Talk was, as usual, brilliant and very practical. My question is how does one find the right balance, especially in these troubled times? between doing duty and the spiritual deep dive because the spiritual journey is so intoxicating over a period of time <laughs> especially when, when one reaches a little age like you know mine is just over 60. Uh, you mm -hmm. all this thing of running around like a chicken with cut feathers looks so ridiculous and one mm -hmm. has a propensity to drop this uh, seemingly nonsensical pursuit of uh, worldly activities. So what's the right balance? I think many of us uh, who are just cross 60 or above would be grappling with it. I suppose till then we really have responsibilities which weigh us down. So what's the mm -hmm. right balance? The right balance, only your own inner voice will show. Therefore, I would um, advise everyone not to miss their threefold you know uh, self discipline don't miss exercises for your physical body 
don't miss meditation for your mind and don't miss your scriptural study for the intellect so when you have this program you want it you know an average of 20 minutes per day you know you exercise then modern sense ways particular uh, you know these certain things are secreted and you have more vitality more vigor you know as we get older we don't care so much for physical vigor we don't have to run a race but we certainly want uh, mental vigor we want you know to be fit we want to be uh, alert enough and so on and uh, physical exercise helps and forms of meditation even if it is sitting quietly listening to some instrumental music for 20 minutes can give to us a certain space otherwise we are mechanically chasing you also use that expression chase chasing task after task looking at things to do and saying oh this is not completed that is not over well all that is true but you need space you need mental space for that some meditation coming down and then study to expand the horizons of your knowledge so if you do this three on a regular basis your inner voice will gather its own strength and it will say to you you i mean everybody here including myself our inner voice says hey you are overdoing over there and you are neglecting over here so work and uh, duty what you call work and sadhana and so on if somewhere a false and wrong yes is about to emerge from us we are about to say yes to some activity to some commitment the inner voice would well in time say don't you say yes you already made this mistake a lot now save the time for something else which is more valuable therefore sir it is a matter of you know empowering the inner voice and this inner voice has to be informed educated by scriptural study by meditation by right foot and exercise and so on then the inner voice is our own the best friend really thank you so standard package for balance in daily life thank you now let's see if anyone else has raised her or his hand you have a text question by prasad vepa yes prasad ji says thank you for your very timely talk could you please comment on shri krishna's opening verse ashochya nanu ashochastvam he seems to be assuring us that all human grief and anxiety is unwarranted which is so assuring do you agree thank you i agree with him but then it is um, you know a tall order and uh, lord krishna begins his instructions in the 11th verse of chapter 2 with a bang we call it sometimes a shock treatment rather than speaking to arjuna at arjuna's own level shri krishna begins at least begins on a very high level he says panditah the wise people neither cry over those who are living nor cry over those who are dead gatasun agatasun scha nanu shochanti pandita who is left then <laughs> nobody is left those who are alive and those who are dead in other words as you have said it in your question to lord krishna says there is nothing at all which uh, makes a wise person cry grieve so it's true from the highest point of view and uh, we have to measure up to it and that is where gita as it proceeds helps us uh, giving us tips on various other levels too varieties of yogas varieties of yajnas are given in the 12th chapter for example sri krishna himself comes down he says uh, four levels he gives you know the best is 
12th chapter bhakti yoga i think starting from verse 8 or so the highest kind are able to naturally and spontaneously think of god the second level goes for abhyasa and then there are expressions like abhyase api asamarthosi if you are unable to do abhyasa then mat karma paramo bhava and then if nothing else is possible phala tyaga you couldn't be god conscious or you couldn't be thinking of god while acting all right no problem when the result comes and suppose it's not favorable to you can you at least at that time say all right it's god's will krishna arpana mastu so shri krishna gives a b c d four levels but you are right in the beginning he says what nonsense nobody would cry over this situation you are crying that doesn't make sense and so on therefore uh, my comment is it's a shock treatment shaking up arjuna and then shri krishna slowly opens up the broader you know canvas oh uh, you have an audio question also you say let me open your microphone then please do ask Uh, Hari Om Swami Ji. I typed out the question earlier because I could not uh, click on this icon. Oh. Can you hear right. me? Okay, yeah, very well. Thank you. Uh, very timely, wonderful talk as always, Swami Ji. The other question is um, your your whole topic uh, today deals with um, you know handling uh, fear and anxiety. Could you? I know we're probably running out of time, but very quickly comment on. what is it that we are afraid of and what is it that we are anxious of it seems to me that our fear is a sort of a universal fear fear of death uh, and the anxiety is the anxiety about suffering you know uh, watching the you know you hear various people talking about their particular experience and how they went through and dealt with um, hmm. uh, uh, chris como here at cnn he was talking about losing something like 9 pounds in 3 days and actually oh. chipped one of his teeth uh, shivering and uh, with the tremors and all that and and all kinds of uh, writhing pain so is is this uh, uh, the 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 fear essentially is the primal fear of of death though we all know that we are going to die and and the anxiety about the suffering and would the uh, ramana way of looking who am i who is suffering uh, and and what is death will that be helpful in dealing with fear and anxiety Mm-hmm. yeah i would uh, agree that uh, the primary fear is of our you know ceasing to exist uh, the fear of death but that is philosophizing a bit uh, uh, too much uh, at the given moment how that primary fear is expressing at a given moment that primary fear fundamental fear of dying expresses not as how oh, i may die but more as um, i may lose all my finances or you know my life is losing its meaning and you know from prosperity or from some kind of control looks like i will be under control you know even national level people are fearing that you know countries who have been doing well so far might be at the mercy of some other countries who were earlier not doing so well and the attachment to our being at the lead attachment to our being in control of things is the cause of fear you know so if we lose that particular position if i was calling the shots and now somebody else calls the shots and i have to toe his line that becomes a scary thing for our ego therefore my summary answer to you in this regard is the basic fear of death at a given moment expresses in uh, various other ways so for someone it may be loss of his contacts loss of his popularity loss of uh, his prosperity and so on so uh, they are all uh, connected but primarily yes it is the fear of death it is said that people with lot of self respect 
regard losing respect in the eyes of others as worse than death if i am not respected by people i would rather die that's how the saying goes right let me quickly go hope i have answered uh, to the point uh, okay Hari Hara is asking since long the first one was yes. to raise correct i am trying to look for Hari Hara. i think i found him Yes, Harihara's mic is uh, it's not turning green. One moment. Has he himself muted his mic? I am trying to unmute it. It says self muted. Maybe on his computer there is a control. Or can you? Uh, uh, Mr. Harihara, can you uh, ask your question in the form of text? Your microphone is not turning on somehow. Meanwhile, Dayananda Gumi says uh, Namaste. Can organizers help his uh, mic turning on? Meanwhile, I'll quickly see you. A.R. Ganti has a question. Timely topic. You reminded us how relevant Gita is and can be to all ages, times, and situations. The key to reflect on it and ask how it applies to the situation at hand. Okay, it's a a few words of appreciation. Thank you, uh, Gantiji. Okay. Okay, Chris Chilukari is waiting. Just a moment. Has Prasad raised the question hand again? Maybe. Okay, I'll ask, uh, I'll check with Krish. Ah, oh, yes, Krish. <laughs> this mic toggles. Myself. Ah, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Hari Om. Okay. Hari Om. Namaste. Hari. Namaste. I have a very simple question. When you talked about, for example, um, chanting Rithinjaya Mantra or etc. as a as a Abhyasa, what we do. Um, at the start of meditation in the morning, I start with you know some basic verses like Suklambara, Taram Vishnu, etc. In doing that, I recognize the following uh, levels, and I want to ask a question in terms of what is knowledge. First, mm -hmm. when you chant the shloka, even if you do not have extraneous wandering thoughts, those are just words resonating in your brain. Mm -hmm. And your brain requires a little bit time for the words to sink in. And it's established scientifically, 100 milliseconds is the time cycle. So you say Shuklambara, it takes 100 milliseconds or more to understand and convert it to a visual or convert it to a something deeper than just the word. Mm -hmm. One or, or, or Sashiwar Nam, the color of the mood, etc. Uh, Bhujam, things like that. It takes some time to convert it to a visual. And then that visual collapses and you say, I understand, which is silence. Mm -hmm. I mean, calm, calm. Mm -hmm. Not silence in an absolute term, but calm. Mm -hmm. So what is the meaning of I understand? What is the meaning of knowledge in this context? Is it simply the thought subsiding says, I know? Or is it a familiarity of thought that is, I know? What is the meaning of knowledge? Mm -hmm. In this context of upasana, it is an upasana after all. The meaning of knowledge is an agreement, you know, agreement or alignment between certain understanding that you have already 
and with the meaning you tapped out of the shloka. If the meaning that you tap, uh, going word by word, uh, you, the meaning you tap from the shloka doesn't align with the sense of divinity that you anyhow carry, then there is no knowledge. Something is missing. Whereas, different upasakas, while reciting Shantakaram, Bhujagashayanam, you know, let us say, or as you gave some other uh, example, they may have uh, uh, different pictures emerging, emerging in their mind. Doesn't matter. Upasana gives a lot of freedom. Now, when I sometimes recite Shantakaram, I don't think of each word meaning at all, though a little I do. Straight away, I think of maybe Lord Venkateshwara in Tirupati or Ananta Padmanabha in Tiruvanantapuram. I just think of that image and the words, you know, I don't pick on every word and go for the meaning. But a sense of I am contacting something divine fills my heart. And that keeps the upasana going. Therefore, knowledge I would uh, visualize as an agreement between agreement between what you regard as divine and what image or interpretation you extract from what you chant. They are in sync. Then you are all set to go. So let's see if there is a last question for this session. Perhaps not. Let me see. Oh, I think uh, Prasad, did you raise the hand again? Uh, uh, no, Swamiji, I think there seems to be some problem with the toggling of the mic. Okay, okay. Then I, I'll... Uh, so uh, wonderful so not just intellectually uh, Purna Rao has a text question Purna says the answer to Prasad's question is the fear of dying alone in an isolation unit and not being able to hear your loved ones or see them yeah the, all those implications come so there is dying and then there is the other aspect of what if I am I am in some quarantine place in some hospital and they don't even let my near and dear ones see me or uh, they don't let me see them and the body is just taken away. So visualization. Now, what does all that mean? I, we are presently very attached to a way of being, being in touch with people, being looked at in some way, carrying an image of ours in the society that is what our life is let's face it and suddenly it is said no, nothing of that you will be dismissed from this world unceremoniously <laughs> so that can be very scary so i do agree it's so many visualizations and my point is underlying all those visualizations are our particular attachments to some images of who we are all right so if i haven't left out any i think harihara finally managed to ask uh, yeah uh, by text because that mic was a problem so harihara's question is the current corona crisis being global are there advices in our scriptures universally applicable for the respective people definitely in fact bhagavad gita I would say is universal, almost uh, you know seventy-five percent. You know, like the uh, other day, who was that? Some spiritual teacher was saying very nicely, when we are asked to take a deep breath, there is nothing called Hindu breath or um, Muslim breath or African breath or Australian breath. Breathing is a very universal human thing. So Sri Krishna talks of several uh, dimensions of spiritual practice where it is very universal. Or sometimes if it is not explicitly or openly universal with a slight change of 
terminology, you think that it can be universal. For example, somewhere is an expression, Vasudeva Sarva Vidhi. The devotee understands Vasudeva is everything and rises to a higher consciousness. So replace that word Vasudeva as pure truth, as the ultimate truth and so on. Some liberal translators and commentators like Eknath Ishwaran have actually given versions of Gita where right away it is speaking in the universal language. Therefore, uh, interpretations of people like Eknath Ishwaran uh, can be an answer to what you are saying, universally applicable. Karma Yoga is universally applicable. So many of these, so I would once more say 75% is already universal unless you communicate it with uh, some very Indian and Hindu uh, words. It is just how you uh, use the word, how you use a certain idiom. It's pretty much universal otherwise. All right. Let us all not make this a mere intellectual affair. Let's live our days, live every day after day with greater involvement in understanding ourselves and coming out of all negative energies within us. Let's strive in the, in the light of Gita's guidance. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevai. Hello, Swami. How are you?